And then as we go a little farther out, of course, you have the Millwood Methodist Church. My parents got married in this church, 3919 Portage Street. And when you look, you can see the parking here. This is Portage right here. You can just pull up the park in front of the church. You've got the, the uh, sign here with the, you know what the service times are and so forth and so on. And then we see it today, and there is no parking in front of it anymore. In fact, trying to back out on Portage Street, I cannot imagine <laughs> trying to back out on Portage Street. We're going to take a huge jump. We're going to take a huge jump all the way over to the far west of the county. We're out here on West Main. Um, we're at the Boylan Buick dealership. The Boylan Buick dealership was an amazing dealership because it was built in that modern-esque style. It was state-of-the-art. It was just a beautiful place to go buy a car. Dealerships were constantly competing with each other to see who could build the fancy dealership to impress the people coming in. And who wouldn't want to go buy a car here at this modern, fantastic dealership? You know, out in this area, this was where the west side of Kalamazoo really began to grow. With the car culture, it allowed this growth. And out on that west side, you had Maple Hill Mall come in. You had West Main Mall come in. You had the Boylan Buick dealership. You had all of these things growing up around automobiles. And what's neat about this is I show this picture to some people, and some of the kids look. There's a couple other pictures he did of it, which I don't have in here. But they looked at it and they said, where are the, where are the hubcaps on the wheels of the cars? And I had to explain to them that, you know, with this type of dealership, what they would do is they'd put the cars out on the lot, and they would keep the hubcaps locked in the trunk of the car. And then when you bought the car, the service department would prep the car for you. They'd take the plastic off the seats, they'd make it look pretty, and they'd install the hubcaps, because one of the thriving commodities amongst youth at that time were hubcaps. How many could you steal? What kind could you steal without getting caught? It's a very different world to look at like this. And I know a lot of you grew up in this world. I have two kind of side stories to this. One involves my uncle. My uncle grew up in Kalamazoo. My uncle took an old car. I want to say his was a 54 Mercury. And he decided to try and rig this car to blow flames out of the exhaust. So he was a pretty enterprising young man. Rigged this car to blow the flames, and he was on West Ridge Avenue. He was trying to impress some young ladies by showing that he could blow flames out of the, trunk, uh, the, the exhaust tailpipes of the car. And while he was doing that, he revved the engine up real high, blew those flames out, and caught the car behind him on fire. He hadn't judged the way those should work. Completely, he said, it melted the paint off the hood, black in the grill. And it was a county sheriff. <laughs> now, to make matters worse, he says the county sheriff pulls us over, is pretty irate, and when he's talking to my uncle, he asks, what's the lever on the dashboard for? And my uncle had to confide in him that he had a keg of beer in the trunk of the car, and he had run a line up to a draw on the dashboard. And he could draw a beer while they were driving and enjoy a beverage. My uncle and his friend went to jail. <laughs> car was impounded, but to show you the time frame, my uncle's, well, my grandfather showed up, and my uncle confided in me that uh, when my grandfather showed up, he told the uh, sheriff, I want to stay in jail. Just, I'll take the time, I'll serve my time. Do not let me go home with my, my dad. My grandpa showed up, they had a conversation, my uncle was let go, his friend's dad showed up, same thing. His punishment was he had to work at the sheriff's office for the summer to raise the money to fix the sheriff's auto. That was it. And my uncle said it was wonderful. He, was, he could have had a record, it could have been bad, but you know, for him, that was a turning point, and it was great. Another story a gentleman confided in me, another friend, uh, they just lived down in Vicksburg. And you know, come Hal, Chevrolet down in Vicksburg used to be there. Uh, he said that they would go on Saturday night to Crum Hallen, and they would pick a car. And they would boost that car, and they would take that car and drive Saturday, and then drive all day Sunday, and just have a ball. And then they would get back Sunday evening, they'd wash the car, they'd detail the car, and they'd park it back on the lot. Because the dealership was closed. Saturday afternoon, and then all Sunday. So, what do you do? And he said, we did this every week. We'd go pick a new car. We'd pick a new car. And he said, it started out pretty simple. You know, a sedan. Another sedan. A station wagon. 
cars that weren't real fancy. And then he said we got kind of brave and we took a really high-end convertible. And he said we were driving down in Indiana with this really high-end convertible and a police officer spotted us and pulled us over because he thought that was a pretty cool car and he wanted to know more about that particular model of convertible and then it came out that, well, they didn't own it. So the car had to be towed back up to Crum Hallen. They had to go meet with Crum Hallen and talk to them. And once again, he said his punishment was working on Crum Hallen's lot for the rest of the summer and through the fall, detailing cars. And that was it. No harm, no fault. So you show kind of that, that difference, you know, the hubcaps. That beautiful dealership. The dealership actually, they tried to save it because the architecture of this dealership was so significant and they really wanted to try and preserve it, and unfortunately, it came down. And today, we don't have an after picture, but today there's a Taco Bell and a couple other things on the site where Boyle and Buick used to be. Back into Portage. We're at the Cool Farm Dairy. I used to go to the Cool Farm Dairy, go and get milk there and, and animal crackers. That was my big treat. I used to play game with a box of animal crackers at the Cool Farm Dairy. That was a fantastic institution, and it's no longer there. Around Cool Farm Dairy, there was also a little kitty amusement park that was back in there. I think some people remember the little kitty amusement park. And we had a hard time finding pictures of that. John Cott did not document, unfortunately, that little kitty amusement park. Now, we talked about people. And right here, this goes back to 1941. We're in November. We're just before the Pearl Harbor attack. We are at the Willows Cafe. I have no idea where the Willows Cafe is. And this is where we get into the whole discussion on John Cott because there are pictures that come up where they're labeled, Willow's Cafe, and then I have to start digging. And I go through old city directories, I go through old phone books, and then eventually I try to locate where this was at. And we found this was located at 4212 South Westage. It was a little kind of club type of uh, venue, dance club and that. And when you look at the picture here, this was taken, I uh, did some research, and November 1st was a Saturday. So Halloween fell on a Friday. And my guess is what you've got going on here is you've got people gathered for kind of a halloween -y type celebration. The only reason I say this is because you have this gentleman right here who is clearly in an appropriate attire. He's a black face with like a white uniform thing on. And my guess is he was dressed up for some Halloween type of escapade or event. You see all the people here, you know, the, the, the cigarette smoking and that. Over here in the corner, this unusual device right here is actually a jukebox. We're playing music, very art deco, very high end. But the Willows Pool was a place to hang out. And the location of this was just to the north of where the A.W. Rooker stand stands on West Ridge today. So just kind of maybe about a half mile down from Kilgore Road to the north. And it stood on the uh, uh, west side of the road. No longer there. In fact, there's nothing there that even indicates that this was here. But these are the moments I love John Pod capture. Because if he hadn't taken that picture, no one would know about it. It'd be gone. Now we all know about the Willows Cafe. You know, it's kind of cool. He did a lot of road developments when he took pictures. We have a lot of aerials that he did of uh, like Interstate 94 being uh, built to US 131. This was probably my favorite out of all of them. He was on the overpass over Southwest Niche. He's looking south. Um, all of these are gone now. You know, the gas station, the shell stations, this is where the, the Holiday Motel is. Holiday Motel is still there. Down here you see the Southgate Motel. We'll get to that in just a minute. You have a trailer sales over here, which is where Bob Evans is, and that's no longer there. But look at the slowness here. <laughs> There's no traffic. <laughs> this, is, this is the height of Portage Rush Hour here in 1959, you know? And, and just four lanes. No turn lane, just four lanes of traffic. Um, there's some interesting stories behind this. I don't know if any of you are aware that, um, first of all, we had these hotels going in because when 94 came through, holy cow, we have a major highway going through our community. We need places for people to get off and stay. So you had how the Holiday Motel. Holiday Motel today is not a very nice motel, unfortunately. When it was built, it advertised color TV, it advertised a swimming pool, it advertised a putting green. And all the rooms were air conditioned. A perfect place to get off the highway and rejuvenate during a long family vacation. And then the Southgate Motel, same thing. Very posh hotel. Lots of state of the art rooms, black and white TVs, and it had an incredible restaurant in the hotel. So you didn't have to travel, you could actually eat at the hotel. So just right off the interstate. Plus, you had the interchange, uh, uh, was it the interchange shell? Yeah, it was the interchange shell. So you get off, and, you know, all these kind of highway turns. Uh, the interesting thing about the highway, though, for those of you who may not know, when they built I-94 and they got to this point, just to the west was a farm and a house 
and they refused to sell their property. And the highway came to a halt. They built the bridge, and that's as far as they went. And you had to get off the highway, and you had to travel down to Millam, up to Oakland, and then you could re-enter the highway. And it was a big deal, and I've heard different stories I've not been able to prove or disprove, but eventually the court stepped in, the payments were agreed upon, the house the property was sold, but I heard that they picked up the house and moved it, and I've yet to find exactly where they relocated the house, but suppose that they moved the house, and then the highway was able to continue. But for the longest time, ladies and gentlemen, 994, here in Portage, was known as the road to nowhere. Just because of that. It's an interesting kind of side fact. We did a lot of research because a few years ago, uh, when they did the huge stimulus package, and Barack Obama and Joe Biden you know, were all about and then Joe Biden came here to Portage to talk about the, they were redoing the bridge because I, uh, you know, part of the stimulus package, and I get a call over at the library from the city hall, and they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, And so I had to sit down and type up a speech. So I actually gave them a speech that was read about the history of the highway with Joe Biden. So I think it's kind of cool. Now, the Southgate Motel. John Todd did things like this, taking a photograph of the original layout of the Southgate Motel. He also dabbled in color film. Very few of his pictures are in color. This is one right here of the fantastic Southgate Motel. I love the neon. We are really bereft of neon on Westage now. It used to be a very heavily neon street, and now it's just kind of all gone. But there's the Southgate. Southgate stood for many years. It actually never really became a dive hotel. It always was a very high quality motel up until its very end. However, the usefulness of the motel, it served its life. The property was sold, and now the location is home to Pet Boys, Carabas, and so forth and so on. As we kind of come down the final stretch here, we get to the corner of Millen and Westage. Absolutely love this picture. We are at Millen, we are at looking at Tom's mobile service here. This right here on the corner is now a Little Caesar's Pizza and so forth and so on. Look at the business, look at the crazy. There's Southbound Mall, which was the original configuration there as an open air shopping center. Here we see the location today. And it changed a lot, you know, it's a very busy corner. But then we go to this. This is my favorite series of photos as far as service stations. John Todd was hired to document the grand opening. Cities, service, stations. Cities doesn't exist anymore. I don't believe it exists anywhere in the country. This building right here, let's see, I think I've gotten after it. We'll find out. Nope. Here we go back. The city service station is where Fannie Mae Candies is today. So uh, it's no longer Fannie Mae, I think they're now in business also. But that building right on that southwest corner of West Ninja Millum is the city service station. And if you look at the building and you go over and look at the side of it, you will see this area bricked over so we can actually match it up if that was the original building. But what I love about this is once again, we talk about the car culture detail. Look at that building opening. It's a grand opening. How many gas stations today do grand openings in the first place? and invite the public to come in and see the gas station. Nobody does that. If the gas station opens, they just open. This right here, it is ready for the public. Here's the inside of the station, staged to show off how wonderful the city's service station is. Look at it neatly lined up, the painted shelves, the, the advertising. Look at their work bay. You can eat off the floor. They even got white sheets over the autos. So when people come in, it doesn't look dirty, it doesn't look dingy. You know, this is absolutely, look at the racks, stage on the walls. Some of my favorite photos. And once again, without John Todd, we would have none of this to kind of represent that particular period in our life. Kids today, and I hate saying that because I never thought I'd get to the point where I say kids today, but kids today just don't understand what it was like to go to a service station. I can remember that transition from full service to self-service, and how people said, self-service, it will never catch up. And it was that weird pump, kind of way off in the distance, yep, that's our self-service pump, way over there, you can use that, that's fine. Today, tell me where you can find a service station that will pump the gas for you. And you, just, you just can't do it. So, the unfortunate thing about losing self-service, I think it damaged a lot of automobiles, because 
you know, full service, they check your oil, check your fluids. Today, people don't do that, you know, and you wonder how many cars are burned up because people just drive without having their oil checked, so. Here we have West of Germany, another one of my favorite photos. Uh, we're standing just on the corner here looking south, and in the distance here, you can see we have uh, Burger Chef, we have Family Foods, we have Miracle Mart, we have Dawn Donuts. Uh, today, Dawn Donuts is, oh, it's a Mexican place, I can't think of the name. Moe's, thank you. It's Moe's. That building is still there, they actually preserved that because the architecture was so significant. Let me tell you, for those of you who never had a Dawn Donut, the cream green donuts were the best donut you could get. Burger Chef, they had great toys in their kids' meals. I know, got several of those. Uh, people don't realize Family Foods was over here. Family Foods was actually located where Joint Fabrics is. So, uh, those trees that remind me of a story, I think in the early 70s, there was some sort of circus with animals in Southland, and a python got those. Yeah. And ended up in those trees. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's the campiness that we kind of, you know, I don't think a python could get cross westerns today. You know, <laughs> it's not, you know. But, my favorite thing is when I saw the Family Foods and I did research about where Family Foods was at, I realized that Family Foods evolved from Family Foods to the Star World Discotheque. And then it evolved from the Star World Discotheque to the Star World Video Arcade. And I used to go to the Star World Video Arcade, I'd bike over there. You could get pizza, you could play games all day for like $5. And when you walked in, the smoke was so thick that you had to kind of crawl along the ground to see where you were going. But the interesting thing is, as scary as that place was, because they had all manners of people there, I never really got a fight there, but there were some intense moments. As scary as that place was, after it closed, it became Joint Fabrics. And if you've ever been to Joint Fabrics during a half-off fabric sale, it is nothing like Star Wars. Star Wars is tame compared to trying to take a piece of fabric out of another lady's hands when it's half-off. It is crazy. So. And believe me, I've been there with that. Don't ask why I was there for that. So, all right, so coming out to the end of our journey, we're out here now in Portage. Uh, we are at the kind of the tail end of West and Cheers, as far as business goes. We're looking at the good old merchandise mart. Uh, Smith and Debris is what some people know it as. Um, it was a neat little business tucked there. It was there for many, many years, serving the needs of the community. Here we have another view, and when you look at this right here, um, people often ask, "What's what's wrong?" Unfortunately, with negatives, some negatives begin to suffer what's called vinegar syndrome. And vinegar syndrome is a kind of falling apart of the negative. It begins to self-destruct. And there's really nothing you can do. You can slow it down by freezing the negatives, keeping them in a deep freeze, and then you scan them and you preserve them this way. The fortunate thing is with the John Todd collection, 99% of the negatives are stable. We've had just a few that have suffered the vinegar syndrome. There's really no rhyme or reason. It just could be a bad development, it could be just a bad film quality, and it just happens. The reason I bring this up is if you have old negatives, and you open the box up to look at those old negatives, and you get a smell of vinegar, vinegar. this is why it's called vinegar syndrome, you get kind of a heavy, thick smell of vinegar, check your negatives out because they could be suffering from this syndrome, and you're gonna to wanna to get those negatives scanned and preserved because eventually it will just degrade to where they're unusable. So this one here, you can see it was getting close. This right here, this whole area, this is all, it's all coming apart. And we were able to piece preserve it because I didn't lose that image. But here we see that location today, Smith Debris was bought out by the city of Portage. Uh, it came in into this kind of water reclamation thing with a waterfall and, and that to kind of bring back nature to the community. We also had at the tail end of our journey here, the Portage Plaza. This is out there. Portage Plaza is still there. Still a pretty viable place right on the Portage Creek. Uh, first library was there. We had a small library that we moved over to the storefront in Portage Plaza. Post office was there where I had to go for selective service, uh, registration, you know. It was, just, it was kind of the hub of the community. Today, it's, it's still there. It's not as grand as it was, but it still functions as a shopping community. And then, as we come into the end, well, I'm sorry, almost at the end, we have the Portage Fire Department. This is township number one. Uh, it was an equal fire department that served once again the community for quite a few years. The problem that they had with the Portage number one was because of the railroad tracks. If the fire was on the other side of the railroad tracks and there was a large freight train running, that presented a problem. That's why we had additional fire stations put in because nothing like telling a house, you know, someone's house is on fire, telling them, well, we have to wait about an hour before the freight train clears to get to the fire. So. I love this vehicle here in front. This vehicle right here is the Portage Self-Defense V2. 
vehicle. This was the vehicle that if we should have a nuclear war or some other major disaster, this was the vehicle that would be employed. The only thing I can see this vehicle doing was saving someone's life because it's made of 100% Detroit steel and can probably survive a nuclear attack through that weight. But one thing that I learned a few years ago was that Kalamazoo, ladies and gentlemen, was on the first wave of a Russian attack. New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Chicago, Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo was on there because we had a giant pharmaceuticals that manufactured anti-radiation style medicine, penicillin, and the like, and the Russians felt that if we hit that complex, they won't be able to produce medicine to help their population, so I don't think this truck really would have mattered a whole lot had we gone to war with Russia at that time. Or so I guess the Soviet Union, sorry. The, now the only thing that exists today of that station, because they built a new one just further south, you see this big tree back here? The big tree is actually still there. That's the big tree. The cemetery has now moved down into the site where the fire station used to stand. And then if you look back here, there's a kind of a tombstone back here. That's actually for the fire station. And it's a neat stone, they've got a picture of it etched on it, and it just talks about that fire station being there at that time. So it's kind of a neat side. We're going to finish today with the Industrial State Bank. We are now on the corner of Westage and Center Avenue. The bank stood on the uh, northeast corner of Center and Westage. It was a site of a one-room school for a while. It was a site of a two-room school. It became the Industrial State Bank. It served the community for, it, it's still serving the community quite well. And there's the location of it today. And then we're going to end the final image, the Zephyr gas station. And I put this up here because, once again, we have a lot of images in our collection that we don't know where they're at. I've tried to research Zephyr, I've tried to find where the Zephyr station stood, I have yet to be able to locate it, but it's such a, I mean, I look at that picture and it just sucks you right in. I mean, I feel like I could step into a warm summer's evening, the crickets are chirping, maybe a radio softly playing in one of those cars, some doo-wop song, and it just, that's the thing about John Todd, is he literally just sucks you in. So, Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you letting me come out and share John Todd with you. Just so you are all aware, if you go to our website, Portage District Library, on there there's a link. We have scanned over a thousand of John Todd's images. They are available to look at online from the comfort of your own. If there's an image that you ever see that you would like to have reproduced or whatever, just contact me at the library. I'm happy to work with you. We have ways of scanning and getting them to you via flash drive or email or what have you. We're very liberal. The whole point of talking to Judy Todd Johnson about her father's collection was they wanted it to be shared and used. They didn't want to be parked in some distant corner. If you're bored and you want to set up an appointment and I can set a pile of photographs down in front of you, you can come in and look through and see what you think. Okay, so I had no problem doing that either. So thanks again. If anyone has any questions, let me know. I'll just turn it back over to Steve, thank you very much. Uh, we have to go to our museum all the students. I'd like to present you with the Gilmore Car Museum, Miles from Ordinary, by you probably know David O'Lyon. He's a great Gilmore oh. friend here. So. Sweet. Thank oh, you thank so you. much. Thank you very much. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it kind of fires me up. That's <laughs>